All right, hello everyone and welcome back to MIT 18.S191, Introduction to Computational Thinking. We're now at lecture 24, um, and just as a reminder, this is part five of the climate modeling unit uh, for the course, which is our, our last topic. So today, um, it's gonna be pretty exciting. We're gonna combine a lot of the ideas from all the past modules of the, the climate modeling unit, um, which can also be thought of as sort of a numerical uh, solutions to partial, partial differential equations unit. Um, and I just wanted to sort of motivate you with um, a really pretty video, which is actually the same model that we're going to build today, basically, um, but run in a non-reactive way so they can afford much higher resolution. And they also use some fancier numerical methods that we won't get into. And what I want to emphasize here is really this left panel, which is showing the top layer of the ocean and colors here are the vorticity. And so, um, like yellow colors are spinning in one direction, black colors are spinning in the other direction. And what you can see is that the ocean is not steady. It's got a lot of this time dependence and a lot of that is happening in these turbulent meanders of this jet that's spinning off a bunch of these um, individual coherent eddies. Um, and that's sort of what, what you know, it, it characterizes a turbulence in the ocean and atmosphere. All right, um, so let's go over some background. So just as a review, um, the first four units of our class, really, we mostly talked about uh, different temperature equations or heat equations. And so to sort of combine all of those things, um, what we talked about was a partial differential equation for the change in time of a temperature or heat, T. Um, and there are gonna be a few different things that change that temperature, such as advection. So um, currents moving heat around um, with some velocity field u um, in the x direction and v in the y direction. And then also um, a diffusion uh, by a diffusivity kappa, um, and this is the diffusion operator, so second derivatives in time, and that acts to basically smooth out uh, temperature peaks. And then finally you have some forcing term. Um, we've talked about radiative forcing terms, so the fact that um, when the ocean absorbs sunlight, it's going to warm up, and it also emits uh, radiation back out to space to cool itself off. Um, so that's great. This is really helpful for understanding how the temperature changes, but so far we've basically always been given a velocity field, u and v. Um, but what actually, you know, where does that come from? Um, where do these ocean currents and these atmospheric winds that give us the velocity field, where do they come from? So it turns out that there's a second set of equations for the velocity, um, and this is just sort of the simplest version you could think of in one dimension. So now we have, uh, so in part two, we have these nonlinear effects. So this is Berger's equation, which is a very simple equation for the velocity. So we have the change in time of the velocity u is again the advection of the velocity, so by itself, um, and a diffusion of that velocity. Um, or a viscous effect. And um, what you'll notice here is that this is a bit different than the temperature because now the temperature was being moved around by some velocity u and v, which was given. Whereas here, the velocity or the momentum is being moved around by itself. Um, and so that, that is basically what we mean by a nonlinear effect. And actually, if you rewrite this equation um, by bringing this, this first u into the derivative uh, using the chain rule, you find that indeed there is this quadratic or nonlinear power uh, of the velocity in its own equation, right? So to know about how the velocity changes in time, we have to know about um, the square of the velocity. And so that turns out that that actually complicates um, the physics and also the numerical implementation of these kinds of equations a lot. And we're gonna get into some of those details later uh, in two dimensions. So just to, to give you a sense of, of like what kind of complications this can arise, we looked before at what happens when you have a sinusoidal uh, wave of temperature. So you might have you know, temp high temperatures here, low temperatures here, and you have some advection and diffusion, which is just sort of moving this forward at a constant pace. So now we're gonna do the same thing, except remember that now the velocity that this signal is moving around by changes in time due to itself. And so in particular, since the velocity here, one, is high to the right, 
this stuff is going to move fast to the right. Whereas this peak down here has a negative velocity u, and so this is going to move quickly to the left. And so what you can imagine is that these two peaks are going to sort of come together, and at some, at some point something's going to happen. So um, I've already run this, so let's look forward in time. So if we just advance this forward, we can see that eventually the two peaks collide, and we get what's called a shock. Um, and this is complicated for the numerics because basically we get a very steep gradient here. There's a very fast change. And so whatever we chose for the time step um, is no longer satisfying our CFL condition. So it's, it's no longer numerically stable. And we get all these numerical instabilities, um, which we really don't want in our solution. Um, so that's just to give you a sense of the kinds of non-intuitive things um, or undesirable things that can happen when you have these non-linear terms in the velocity field. Okay, so that was just sort of a toy equation of the Burgers equation, um, but it turns out that we actually know the full equations that govern fluid flow. So if we're now thinking about a three-dimensional fluid, um, u is the velocity, and that has a direction in x, which is just the u component, um, in y, so sort of like uh, north-south, which is the v component, and then up and down as well, which we haven't talked about yet. That's the w component. And so the Navier-Stokes equations is basically in a, a set of equations for the full velocity vector. So that's really three equations, one for each of these components. Um, but you can write it in vector notation as, as sort of one single equation. Um, and so what that is is basically you've got this change in time. Um, you have this nonlinear advection term, a pressure gradient term, a gravity term, and a viscous uh, diffusion or dissipation term. Um, and I, this is a really you know, rich equation. There's a lot going on here. Um, you, know, you can go take other classes and find out how this is derived. We're really not gonna talk about this too much. I just wanted to put it here in all of its glory for you to see it um, because it does come up a lot. And I, I think the best way to interpret this equation is really as sort of a fluid equivalent of F equals MA, Newton's law. And so um, here I've just written that in sort of the same way. So we have some mass, which is here the density of the fluid, times the acceleration, which is here um, basically acceleration along a streamline. Or you can think of this as sort of the point-wise acceleration. And then the forces acting on the fluid. And so there's a pressure term. So um, basically body forces of the, the fluid acting on itself in different places. A gravity force, so that's just the Earth tugging on, on the fluid, um, and then also this uh, viscous dissipation term. Um, great, uh, or friction. And so um, in words, you can sort of write it out like this. Um, and this is, this is basically just F equals MA, but for a fluid. Um, and yeah, there's also this second equation, continuity, which basically just makes sure that uh, mass is conserved for an incompressible fluid. But again, we, we won't really talk about these any further. I just wanted to sort of put them out here um, and make the connection with F equals MA so you know where they came from. So you can directly solve this equation uh, using numerical methods like we talked about, uh, but doing it in three dimensions and all of its glory is, is a bit complicated. And also, it's, it'll run really slow, so it's not really helpful for, um, for these kinds of interactive demos. And also, um, it's not really relevant to the ocean, because in the ocean, we don't really care about things like the molecular viscosity. Um, and, and we can't, you know, we, this isn't the exact form that we're going to use in an ocean model. So instead, um, I'm going to talk about this equation, which you can actually derive directly from the full Navier-Stokes equations. I'm not going to show the derivation. It's a bit involved. If you want to know more about that, take uh, 12800 in the Earth Sciences Department, um, course 12, or any of the other courses in our department are basically based on equations like this. Um, so this is sort of a simplified equation in two dimensions for ocean currents. This is actually the equation I solved to give you the ocean currents that we used in um, lecture, the fourth lecture of the climate unit, and also in the last homework. Um, and basically, it's, it's two equations. So one is this vorticity equation for zeta, which is the relative vorticity or the angular momentum of the fluid. Uh, 
So that's a new variable we've introduced. And then the second thing it depends on is the uh, stream function psi. Um, and that's basically a convenient way of, of condensing both the uh, east-west velocity u and the north-south velocity v into one variable. And you can do that for an incompressible fluid. And that's sort of its definition here. Um, the point is basically we now have an equation for the fluid based on this, this angular momentum variable um, that we can time step. The one complication though is that this psi itself also depends on uh, the vorticity zeta. And so there's a second equation here, which is a Poisson equation, which says that the sort of the definition of the, of the relative vorticity is that it's uh, basically this Laplacian of the stream function psi. And so in practice, what this means is that if we want to time step this equation, at every time step, we also have to solve this one to figure out what is psi for a given zeta. All right, so let's look at how this time step thing would work in practice. Um, so we have now these two couple PDEs, um, and let's say we start from an initial condition uh, zeta at time zero, or time step n equals zero. So at that time step, we are first going to invert this Poisson equation to get psi at time zero. Um, and since this is the first time step, we don't have, even have any guesses uh, for doing this inversion. So we're just going to have to do the, the Jacobi iteration with sort of a, a, you know, a generic guess of zeros everywhere, for example. Um, and then we'll time step forward because now we can, since we have both zeta at time step n and psi at time step n, we can now time step uh, the vorticity equation up here to get the zeta at the next time step. Um, and then we just repeat this algorithm going back to step two, inverting the Laplacian or the, the Poisson equation, and then time stepping forward again. And, and we'll go through the, the numerical implementation of this. Um, okay, so as before, we first set up our grid. Um, this is the exact same you know, grid construct that we used in, in the past lecture, so I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, we'll start with just 30 grid points, so this is 30 by 60, so there's twice as many in the north-south direction. Um, and here I'm just sort of non-dimensionalizing all the parameters, so we're not, um, basically, we're just going to sort of deal with unitless numbers just, so, uh, just to simplify things, but um, you could add in the units again if, if you wanted to. Um, so these are the sort of key parameters in the equation. I just set sort of interesting values um, that I got from the literature. Okay, so the first step is implementing uh, an algorithm for inverting the Poisson equation for psi. So thankfully, we've already been introduced to the Jacobi iteration algorithm, um, which Professor Edelman and John Urschel um, both introduced earlier in the class. John Urschel talked about this uh, multi-grid approach for speeding that up. Um, we're not going to use the multi-grid thing here because we don't really need to. Um, but I did just borrow his, um, his actual solver. Um, so that has two steps. One is to actually do the Jacobi step. Um, and here, all we've done is just added this one line because the algorithm they actually introduced in their lectures was for the Laplace equation, which just has this right-hand side term equal to zero. Now we have the second term, this zeta, um, but it turns out we can use the algorithm the exact same way. We just have to subtract um, from our iteration the psi at that grid cell um, times this delta x squared. Um, right. Um, so this is our, for doing one step of the Jacobi iteration, and then our Poisson solve function, um, which used to be called simulation, is now basically going to do a certain number of steps until we get uh, within some tolerance or some error of uh, the last time step. Um, so just to make sure that we've converged on the correct solution. Um, and that's the exact same uh, algorithm that we had before uh, for the Jacobi iteration. So to, to sort of illustrate how this process works, we're going to do the example of the Rankine vortex, which we've seen before. Um, so I've just sort of initialized it here. 
basically it has initial vorticity of one in a circle in the middle of the domain and then zero everywhere else. Um, and so in the Poisson, or in the, um, in the Poisson solve or the, the Jacobi uh, iteration, what we do is we start with uh, a guess for the initial vorticity, which is just zero everywhere, um, or equivalently a stream function, which is zero everywhere. And then we're just gonna go through the iterations one by one and see how it converges. So first, you know, we'll see that there's this stream function is spinning up here. We've got some non-zero um, vorticity starting out. And then as we step forward, now we're at 100 time steps, we're getting pretty close to our initial uh, condition. So this is just a check, basically, where we know what the answer for the vorticity should be. Um, we're doing the inversion to get the stream function. And then we're diagnosing the vorticity from the stream function as a verification. So these two should be exactly the same once we've converged. Um, and that's just a check to make sure that we're actually um, doing this properly. And indeed, once we get up to, you know, about 400 iterations or so, 500 iterations, we're getting really close to our initial condition. So um, this gives us some confidence that this stream function has indeed converged um, and that our, our Jacobi or our Poisson solver is, is working correctly. So that's great. Um, okay, so that's part one of our algorithm. We have a way of getting from some uh, vorticity field, we can now get a stream function, um, which is consistent with that. So the second part is now um, the time stepping. Um, before we do the time stepping, we, we just have to um, also add in some boundary conditions. So we're just doing really simple boundary conditions here, which are called slip. So that's where the vorticity on the boundary is equal to zero exactly. Um, and then impermeability, which is that the stream function on the boundary is zero. Um, you can basically think about this as saying that water can't leave our boundary. So um, you're sort of conserving mass within this boundary. Okay, so the next thing is our tendency terms. So just like we did for all of our past models, we're gonna implement these one at a time as Julia functions. Um, and we'll use multiple dispatch to do this in two steps. So the first is calculating this for a given grid cell ji, um, and then we're gonna loop through all of those, uh, for, through the whole grid uh, to get the full 2D array back. So this vorticity advection term, this is just the gradient operator, which we've seen before. So we have our x gradient kernel multiplied by the stream function, um, and that gives us that term. And then we just loop through that. So it's gonna look something like this. Um, Basically what that's saying is that it's gonna decrease the vorticity on the right-hand side and increase it on the left-hand side. Over time, what this is gonna do is sort of move this vortex to the left. Okay. Uh, and by the way, this is sort of the same idea for why hurricanes always move from uh, east to west. It's because of this planetary vorticity advection which decreases the strength of the hurricane to the east and increases it to the west, so it's gonna translate uh, to the west over time. Okay, um, so then now we have our vorticity diffusion term, and so what this is going to do is just uh, decrease any peaks of vorticity and sort of spread it out. And so to implement that, um, again, we just use now our diffusion kernel, which we have from before, multiply that by um, our vorticity zeta, um, and that finishes that term, so that's pretty straightforward, and you can see that um, with that, the effect of that tendency is that it's decreasing the vorticity in our vortex and increasing it on the edges. So it's spreading that vortex out. It's making it bigger and bigger over time. All right, so now we have the tricky term, which is the nonlinear vorticity affection. Um, so we would hope that basically each of these derivatives we can treat separately and just do centered differences like we've done before. Um, so this one, right, you just do a center difference in x, um, so in, with the i uh, coordinate, and this one we would do in j or in y, um, and that gives us this nice simple term with just, you know, these four uh, differences. Unfortunately, um, this representation is actually not very good because it does not conserve energy um, or the, the 
angular momentum variance or entropy, which is sort of like the rotational equivalent to energy. Um, so unfortunately, we can't use this one in our ocean model. Um, and there is a correct version that you can do, which is basically a linear combination of a whole bunch of different types of ways of discretizing it. Um, I'm not even going to write it out, but this is what it looks like once you've implemented it. Um, this was sort of figured out in the 60s um, and is sort of how some of the first climate and weather models were, were coded up. Um, but the point is just that, again, these nonlinear terms are not as straightforward as all the linear things that we've been doing so far. And so there are some subtleties um, where you have to you know, avoid uh, some instabilities or, or avoid um, you know, breaking conservation of energy and things like that. Um, okay, so once you have the right kernel, you can write up this term. It's gross, but it works. Um, and again, we just loop through those. And this one is a little less intuitive um, and basically it, it's got sort of all these different effects which are going to act to sort of tear apart this vortex over time. Um, right, so it's, it's sort of making the vortex unstable. Okay, and then finally our last term is wind forcing. So this is the extra thing that we're going to add to the simulation to actually get it started. And so what happens is um, basically this is wind blowing over the ocean and it's going to basically remove vorticity from this northern gyre and increase vorticity in this southern gyre. In other words, it's going to make this one rotate counterclockwise and this one rotate clockwise. And that's sort of what actually happens in the Atlantic. So this is our subtropical gyre that has the Gulf Stream and comes up the coast of the US. And this is our subpolar gyre which comes down from, uh, from Greenland and Canada. All right, so now that we have all of our forcing terms, we can write our time step function. Um, note that this now has two steps, right? First, we have to do our Poisson solve to figure out what the psi that uh, goes along with our zeta is. Um, and then we can basically calculate all of our tendency terms, add them up, multiply by the time step, and we're off. Um, so there's our time stepping, and then here we can sort of visualize what's going on. Um, so I, I'm starting out at time zero with zero vorticity and zero stream function. And so we're gonna basically instantly turn on the winds and see what happens. Um, so here we go. So the first thing that happens is basically you start up at, you are removing vorticity from the left, so you're making it spin uh, this way, and you're adding vorticity in this one, and so you're making it spin this way. Um, and if you think of the stream function, that's basically doing the same thing. It's gonna make it spin this way. Um, and what's happening over time is because of the planetary uh, vorticity advection, these stream functions, or this vorticity, is actually moving to the left, and it's hugging the western boundary over here. Um, and what that's going to do is eventually it's going to make these, these western boundary currents on the left that are going up here and down here. Um, and that's basically why we have a Gulf Stream um, or these, these western boundary currents. So in any gyre in the ocean, you're always going to have a really strong current on the west. Um, and it's for the same reason that hurricanes always move to the west. Just in general, whenever you have some kind of vortex or gyre, uh, in the ocean or atmosphere, it's always going to move west um, because of this planetary rotation term. Um, right, so that's um, pretty much all we have. So, you know, we can run this forward. Um, unfortunately, it's not fast enough to make a pretty movie like this one, but I do want to just show this again because this is the same model just with a lot more computational resources thrown at it. Um, and some slightly fancier methods. Um, and this is basically what happens, is that you have a gyre here um, and a gyre here, and where they meet in the middle, they form this unstable jet that sheds off all of these eddies. Um, and so this is sort of what's actually happening in the atmosphere and ocean, is that it's not just that you have these nice, clean uh, gyres like this, which are sort of spinning this way and this way, um, but you also have these, these jets in the middle that are really strong, really unstable, 
um, and give you the, this really strong editing field. Yeah, and that's it. So thanks everyone for watching, um, and yeah, have a have a good week. We'll see you on Thursday for the live lecture, where we'll talk about um, you know what is a state of the art climate model, how do you write them up, what does the code look like, um, who makes them, and things like that.